Hi all. It's great to be back for season three of the Troubles podcast. During the downtime, I spent a lot of time researching future episodes, and I also spent some time in Belfast and Derry, and I got the chance to visit some of the locations which have featured prominently in some episodes. I'm currently in the process of getting more interviews for the podcast. Before we get into this episode, I just want to talk quickly about the Patreon. I still work a full-time job, which does make it difficult to find the time to continue making this podcast, but it is something that I'm very passionate about. And the feedback from you, the listener, over the past two years has really helped encourage me to keep going. The Patreon is a great way to show your support. I release the episodes there early, and I also put out a companion video with each episode. On Patreon, the episodes are also completely ad-free, and you can listen on your own personal RSS feed on your podcast player. I'll also be posting there the full show notes for every episode. You can support the podcast over at patreon.com forward slash the troubles podcast. Alternatively, if you'd like to support the podcast in a once off fashion, you can do that over at buymeacoffee.com forward slash the troubles podcast. You can also support the podcast by leaving reviews or simply telling your friends. It all helps. Thanks. And now let's get into it. It's April 2002 in the Colombian city of Bogota. A bomb has just gone off, causing chaos around the city. Two policemen had been trying to remove a body from a vehicle when the bomb detonated. The body was that of a farmer who had been abducted and killed the night before. The man's body had been booby-trapped with explosives, so that it would detonate as the police tried to remove it from the scene, killing the two of them. When it came to who planted the bomb, there was some confusion. This attack was not typical of FARC, who in the previous 40 years had been focusing their attacks outside of larger cities, in rural areas. But to some, this bombing was reminiscent of attacks that had been taking place across the Atlantic Ocean, in Northern Ireland. But how could a bombing a whole continent away be connected to the IRA? That's what we'll be finding out in this episode. This is the Troubles podcast a podcast which explores the violence and bloodshed that occurred in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain as multiple sides and organisations waged a bloody conflict over the status of Northern Ireland. Colombia is a South American country with a storied past. Situated in the northwest of South America, the present territory of Colombia was a corridor of early human civilization from Mesoamerica and the Caribbean to the Andes and Amazon Basin, which was inhabited by early hunter-gatherers and then Amerindians. The country's name is derived from the infamous explorer, Christopher Columbus. Europeans first arrived in Colombia in 1499, and the Spanish conquistadors established their first settlement there in 1533. Indigenous populations in areas that were settled by the Spanish experienced large declines in populations, as a result of the settlement and also at the arrival of Eurasian diseases. Over the next few centuries, there were many rebel movements, fighting against Spanish rule, but these were either deemed too weak to be successful, or they were crushed by the Spanish. However, in 1810, a movement began which eventually led to the complete independence from Spain. Spain did briefly retake control, but the rebel movement was much stronger by this stage, and they secured Colombia's complete independence by 1822, when the pro-Spanish resistance was defeated. After a two-year civil war in 1863, the United States of Colombia was created, lasting until 1866, when the country finally became known as what we see today, the Republic of Colombia. Colombia experienced significant unrest in the 1940s and 1950s, in what has become known as La Violencia. It was caused by tension between the two biggest political parties, and upwards of 200,000 Colombians lost their lives most of them being peasants and labourers. In 1953, the country experienced a military coup, and General Gustavo Rojas was placed in power, and subsequently declared martial law in the country. He was in power until 1957, when the people of Colombia, dissatisfied with his leadership, replaced him with a military junta of five generals. That same year saw the declaration of Sitges, which said that a national front should be established and that the Conservative and Liberal parties would govern jointly, alternating control every four years. In 
This agreement did bring about peace, but basically shut out any other political party from being represented, and many of the poorest people in Colombia felt that they had absolutely no say in the government. Then in the 1960s, the Colombian government adopted a policy of accelerated economic development, which saw the arrival of large-scale industrial farming to the country. This encouraged the development of massive private farms to operate, but it came at the expense of small-scale family farms that made food for local consumption. Thousands of farmers were forcibly evicted from their land and moved to cities where they were forced to join the industrial labour pool, which led to less pay, more difficult work, and a worse quality of life in many cases. Communists and the idea of communism had been active in rural and urban Colombia since directly after World War I. In 1930, the Colombian Communist Party was established and they established peasant leagues, which called for improved living and working conditions, education and rights for the working class. They also violently opposed the state seizure of lands. The government of Colombia began actively attacking these communist groups in the early 1960s, with a large amount of support from the United States, who were trying to stamp out the spread of communism around the world at the time. During this time, many left and right-wing armed groups were established to fight back against the government. This included M19, the EPL, the ERF, and of course, FARC. The Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, was founded shortly after these attacks began, Promising to overthrow the corrupt government, FARC operated in a guerrilla-style manner, hitting out at Colombian government troops and then disappearing back into the jungle. As they prospered in the cocaine trade, FARC became significantly wealthier and its numbers grew so it began to stage larger-scale attacks. The vast majority of cocaine that was created by FARC was exported to the United States of America, so it was in the USA's best interest to provide support that would lead to the elimination of these groups. FARC's overall aim is to install a communist regime in the country which would help the poor, but in order to do so they needed training in guerrilla warfare. So they began sending members to Vietnam and to the Soviet Union to get further military training. Because of a booming trade in cocaine, FARC had plenty of money at its disposal, sequestered away in bank accounts around the world, and they wanted to find new ways to wage war against the security forces in Colombia. Though Colombia and Northern Ireland are vastly different places, FARC and the Provisional IRA were both relatively small paramilitary groups, waging war against the much larger security forces of a country, so the type of war had to be very specific. Launching an attack and then disappearing was usually the best strategy. In Colombia, members of FARC could simply disappear into the jungle, and in Northern Ireland, members of the Provisional IRA could disappear into the Republic of Ireland where the British Army were not allowed to chase them, though the Irish police force, the Gardaí, could. In the early 90s, the Provisional IRA had been experiencing a moderate form of success waging war against security forces in Northern Ireland. To be honest, the word success is debatable, but they had been inflicting a lot of structural damage to RUC stations, army barracks and security checkpoints around the country, using their advanced mortar technology. The Provisional IRA was quite savvy when it came to the development of new weapons designed to cause maximum devastation when used against the British Army and security forces. They were particularly successful with the development and refining of mortars, which became a serious threat to the security forces in the early 90s. A mortar is essentially a bomb which could be fired from a distance away, which wouldn't explode until it impacted with the intended target. It usually consisted of a metal propane cylinder about one metre in length, which was filled with homemade explosives. These cylinders could be hidden nearby the target in a van or in hay bales or buried in a field, and then detonated remotely when ready. The range of these mortars was anything between 75 to 275 metres. These mortars would go on to be referred to by the British Army as the Flying Car Bomb. The Mark I was unveiled in 1972, and over the next few years there would be 16 other variations and improvements on the Mark I. The Mark 10 mortar was used between 1979 and 1994 and was quite lethal. It was used in the 1985 Murray mortar attack, which resulted in nine police officers getting killed. The mortar was bolted to the back of a Ford lorry. The Mark 10 was also used in an attack on Downing Street, the home of the British Prime Minister, on February 7, 1991. No one was killed, but the three mortar shells that were fired came very close to hitting the right building. <laughs> 
The Mark 15 mortar became known as the Bark Buster and was particularly effective. It was used around 1992. It was around this time that the IRA began trying to use them to take down British Army helicopters. They were successful on March 19, 1994, when they used the Mark 15 mortar to take down a Lynx helicopter that had been hovering on a landing pad at an army base in Cross Maglen, Armagh. No one was seriously killed in the attack, but later that year the IRA took down another helicopter using the Mark 15. Again, there were no casualties. This was around the time of the South Armagh Sniper Brigade, so the British Army was under an immense amount of pressure in this region. These mortars were indeed powerful and had the potential to cause devastating amounts of damage, but they were also incredibly inaccurate, as they would need to be in a very precise position when armed, and any small change in the degree of the angle could send the shell well away from their intended target. Though somewhat rudimentary sounding, these mortars were quite unique and specific in their design, and many were surprised to find similar or even identical technology being used in Colombia by FARC rebels. In Colombia they were called cylindros, which is basically cylinders in English, and had been used in the country since 1998. These cylindros had been causing devastating amounts of damage in Colombia, one such being the Bohaja massacre which happened on May 2nd 2002. FARC had attacked a right-wing militia group known as the AUC in the town of Bella Vista. The two groups were fighting for control of the Atrado River, which would have had strategic importance with the drug trade. Members of the AUC were positioned on the walls of the church in the town, and there were 300 inhabitants of the town had taken refuge inside the church for safety. A member of FARC fired a cylindros at the AUC, but the bomb went through the roof of the church and landed on the altar and detonated, killing 119 people inside. This was one of the many, many attacks that would take place over these years, and it wasn't long before FARC had become synonymous with the use of these deadly mortar bombs. But it wasn't always this way. For four decades, FARC had been expanding its influence over the country, fighting primarily in equatorial jungles. They would eventually have influence over one-third of Colombia, under the command of Manuel Marulanda. Marulanda was concerned that in its current state, FARC would eventually lose to Colombian forces, backed by the US government. Up until this point, FARC had been using very basic mortars, and even donkey bombs, which are exactly as they sound, bombs strapped to donkeys. Marulanda realised that FARC needed to modernise the way that they fought. They also needed to take the fight into the cities and streets of Colombia. To do this, they needed help in producing mortars and homemade rockets. So how did FARC go from bombs strapped to donkeys to devastating cylindros? The answer is still up for debate, but it does bring us to a rainy Saturday morning on August 11, 2001. Four companies of military policemen and intelligence agents took up their positions in the terminal of El Dorado Airport in Bogota, the capital city of Colombia. The 150-man operation were waiting on a flight coming in from another region of Colombia, San Vincent del Caguan, which is a cattle ranching area in the south of the country. It's also a region which had a very heavy FARC presence. Intelligence had come in, telling the authorities that there were three men on the flight who were members of the provisional IRA, and that they had spent the last five weeks training FARC rebels on how to make bombs, as well as training them in urban warfare tactics. The three men touched down, and as they made their way to their departure gate, where they would get their flight out of the country, the authorities swooped in, arresting them. One of the men spoke Spanish and handed over three passports to the authorities. The names on the passports read Edward Joseph Campbell, John Joseph Kelly, and David Bracken. It soon transpired that these passports were fakes, and the men's actual names were Niall Connolly, James Monaghan, and Martin McCauley. James and Martin were identified as two senior members of the provisional IRA, and initially authorities were unsure who Niall was, until he was recognised by Cuban authorities as Sinn Féin's man in Cuba. Here's Alex Maskey, a representative of Sinn Féin, responding when asked why the men were there. I have no idea why they were there. I do not have to explain on behalf of Sinn Féin why those people were in Colombia. 
It's not the business of Sinn Féin either in Colombia, so therefore I don't have to give a, an explanation. But I don't have an explanation, which is the essential point that people need to understand. I don't have an explanation. They were not there on behalf of our party, so therefore I don't have to give an explanation. I don't have one. The three men claimed that they'd been meeting with FARC guerrillas to discuss the burgeoning peace process in the country, as well as birdwatching. But the Colombian security forces had a different view on what they were doing. Colombian army officials released their version of events that transpired during the five weeks that the men were in the country. That account claimed that on July 3rd, the men met with a FARC official who then drove them six hours to a number of FARC training camps. The plan was simple. The IRA men would train members of FARC on how to construct mortars and in exchange, FARC would reward them with millions of dollars that they had sequestered away in offshore bank accounts. Profits from decades of selling cocaine to the USA. This had the potential to reward the provisional IRA handsomely. So who are these three men who have taken on the job? James Mortar Monaghan, as the media referred to him, was the man who developed the IRA's first mortar, the Mark I, back in 1972. He also designed remote control devices that the IRA could use to detonate landmines and bombs. Martin McCauley was also involved in the weapon making of the provisional IRA. He was tasked with operating weapons and devices. The third man, Niall Keneally, was the only Spanish speaker in the group and did not have links to the provisional IRA, but rather Sinn Féin, who were the political wing of the IRA. The Cuban Foreign Ministry confirmed that he was Sinn Féin's liaison in Cuba, even though Sinn Féin initially denied that he had anything to do with them. The Guardian newspaper reports that it is alleged that it was Keneally who acted as the liaison between the provisional IRA and FARC. It is reported that the Colombian authorities were tipped off about the men being in the country by an international security agency. So who was following these men? The British MI5 and MI6 deny that they have any role in tipping off Colombian authorities as the peace process in Northern Ireland was in full swing at this time. The idea of British intelligence services monitoring Irish nationals could damage relationships between governments, so the chances of MI5 or MI6 admitting to it would have been very low. The American CIA was also very active in Colombia during this period, so there is a chance that they could have tipped off authorities. It soon emerged that this wasn't James Monaghan's first time in the country and that he had visited four other times since 1991, using the alias Edward Joseph Campbell. In fact, investigations revealed that at least 10 to 12 IRA figures have visited Colombia since the mid-1990s. An Irish government source believes that it was unwise for the men to travel there and assumed that they would be doing so covertly. Quote, It seems stupid and idiotic to send known players to Colombia Given the fact that the CIA is crawling all over the place and every Western national that arrives in Bogota is checked out thoroughly because of the drug trade. What's worse is that for the Americans, FARC is public enemy number one, given its role in exporting cocaine to North America. Initially, the three men were charged with travelling with fake passports, but this charge was soon upgraded to the charge of training FARC rebels in bomb making. Back home on the island of Ireland, a campaign called Bring Them Home had been launched as families of the men and supporters lobbied for their return to Ireland. They claimed that the men's lives were at risk if they remained in Colombian prisons. Sinn Féin wanted to distance themselves from the men. Katrina Rowan, a civilian who initially had no affiliation to Sinn Féin, ended up in charge of the Bring Them Home campaign. Rowan was very quick to deny that Sinn Féin had anything to do with the Bring Them Home campaign, though she did end up joining Sinn Féin and has gone on to become a prominent politician with the party. Here is her explaining why the men were there. Well, because of all the uh, spin and counter spin and intelligence reports after the men were arrested, um, the men took out uh, a paid ad in El Tiempo in a Colombian newspaper. And in that ad, they stated very clearly that they were in Colombia and they were studying the peace process in the demilitarized zone. SDLP member Alban McGuinness had this to say about the men and their situation. It is quite clear that there are quite a number of questions that remain unanswered. Why were three members of the Republican movement, one member, the official representative of Sinn Féin in Cuba, why were they in the Colombian jungles? Why were they in a situation where they would come into contact with FARC? Now, the explanation given by Katrina Ruan tonight is that these were political tourists 
if they were interested in the peace process in Colombia. <clears throat> if that was true, there was a legitimate way of doing that because plenty of foreign visitors went to Farkland through the legitimate uh, offices of the Colombian government and the Colombian people uh, provided safe access to that area. The DUP's Jeffrey Donaldson said this. Uh, at least two of these three men were known to the security <laughs> forces in Northern Ireland. One of them, I believe, has a terrorist conviction. Um, and uh, uh, the other, uh, the third man, uh, as Alban McGuinness has said, is the Sinn Féin representative in Cuba. They were there uh, on uh, false passports. Uh, if they were studying the peace process, I'd like to know who else they talked to apart from FARC. There's no evidence that they did talk to anyone else. I think it's pretty clear um, uh, that uh, these people were there, engaged in international terrorism. They were helping to train a terrorist organization. You know, it is further evidence that the IRA mixes in international terrorist circles. I don't believe for one moment that uh, these people were eco-tourists, uh, that they were there studying a political process. They were there uh, engaged in international <coughs> terrorist activities, training an organization um, to engage in uh, a political campaign of violence. And we see the result of that on the streets of Colombia. The three men became known as the Columbia Three, and they initially boycotted proceedings, which eventually went to trial on December 2nd, 2002. They arrived at the court to a small group of protesters. One bore a sign saying, IRA, go home and kill your own people. There were supporters outside the court as well, bearing signs that read, We demand freedom for the three Irish prisoners in Colombia. Tests of explosive residue were carried out on the men and their belongings by an expert from the US Embassy, and traces of nitro, tetril, HMX, TNT, and ammonium nitrate, among other substances, were all found. There was a good few twists and turns in this case, though. The defence called British explosives expert Keith Borer to the stand, who said that the methods in use by the IRA and FARC were not similar. The defence also called a number of people to the stand to testify. One individual brought a video into the court to try and prove that Monaghan couldn't have possibly been in Colombia at the time he was charged with training FARC, but this video evidence was soon discovered to have been digitally manipulated. In court, Monaghan stood up before the judge and said, quote, in the summer of 2001, we travelled to Colombia, principally to see the peace process, but also to enjoy a holiday. The charge of training the FARC is a false charge based on false evidence. Proceedings lasted until August 1st, 2003, where the men were found guilty of travelling with false passports. They received varying sentences of up to 44 months in prison. They were subsequently found not guilty on the charge of training FARC rebels. So why were they found not guilty? There really wasn't enough concrete evidence to pin the charges on the men. There were three witness statements stating that the men had been seen in FARC-controlled territory, but these sightings contradicted each other. After the trial, the men immediately launched an appeal. While awaiting a second trial, the men were free to move around but ordered not to leave the country of Colombia. The following day, they went into hiding, claiming that their lives were at risk. Then shortly after that, the three men completely disappeared. With no sign of the three men, the appeal went to court, where the original sentence was overturned and the men were found guilty in absentia, of training FARC rebels and sentenced each man to at least 17 years in jail on December 16, 2004. In early August 2005, eight months after the men disappeared from Colombia, they reappeared they had somehow been smuggled back to the Republic of Ireland. Upon arriving in the country, Jim Monaghan spoke with Irish news reporter Charlie Bird. When asked how he got home, Monaghan said, quote, I'm back in Ireland only a few days, and as you can imagine, a lot of people in a lot of countries had to help us, and I can't endanger those people by giving any details about who they were or even where they were, so I'm afraid I can't go into any detail about how we got here. Upon learning that the men had reappeared, a Columbia judge requested the return of the three men, but did not issue a formal extradition request. Ireland also does not have an extradition treaty with Colombia, and were a request ever to appear, it would be strongly contested by the lawyers of the three men. Their arrival in Ireland was met with a mixed response, 
They were questioned by the Irish Gardaí, but never arrested. Peter Robinson, who was the deputy leader of the DUP at the time, said of the men, quote, The Taoiseach would do well to remember the words of George Bush, that those who harbour terrorists are terrorists. These are convicted terrorists. They need to be handed back to face their appeal, or be put in prison as quickly as possible. It is as simple as that. The arrest of the Columbia Three happened at the same time as a number of significant incidents around the world. In Northern Ireland, the provisional IRA had just committed to decommissioning their weapons, and the fact that their members were being accused of travelling to a different country and training other paramilitary groups really did not instil confidence that the IRA were committed to abandoning their violent past. It was also deeply embarrassing for Sinn Féin that one of their representatives was part of the three men and they apparently didn't know, first denying he was a member altogether before eventually saying he was. As well as that, shortly after this arrest, the September 11th attacks happened in the USA. The USA was an extremely important ally for Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin looked to the USA for financial support and over the years have raised millions in funding. American cash donors were essential to the survival of Sinn Féin. But an America that was dealing with the fallout of their own terror attack, 9-11, did not look favourably on an Irish political party that was suddenly linked to terrorist activity in Colombia. One security source in The Guardian said, quote, It is all of a piece with what we know about the way the provisionals have been behaving right through the ceasefire. They have continued to raise money, keep up their contacts with other organisations abroad, and have continued to train for terrorist operations. George Bush's Director of Counterterrorism, Francis Taylor, described FARC as the most dangerous terrorist group in the Western Hemisphere. They had celebrated the 9-11 attacks and had also called for the abduction and murder of US citizens. Historically, people in the US had sympathised with, and in some cases helped to fund, the IRA. But to find that the IRA was helping a sworn enemy of the US was a significant blow in popularity of the IRA and Sinn Féin with people in America. The arrest of the Columbia Three was discussed in the USA at the House of Representatives International Affairs Committee. Here's what was said of the men's defence. Claims that these individuals were there for benign purposes, specifically ecotourism, or for activities related to the Irish and Colombian peace processes are an insult to our intelligence. The point that they couldn't agree on is whether the Columbia Three were rogue agents of the IRA or if they were acting under the instruction of the IRA. Congressman William Delahunt voiced his support for the men. Unfortunately, we have been presented with a report shot on facts and replete with speculation and surmise and opinion. It is as if the purpose of today's hearing is not to determine the facts, but rather to rubber stamp a preordained conclusion to fit a particular agenda. As a result of the fallout of the arrest of the Columbia Three and the world climate after 9-11, the US began putting a large amount of pressure on the provisional IRA to decommission their weapons. Just for anyone who's unaware, decommissioning refers to the handover or verified disposal of weapons by paramilitary groups. And it was to be the final stage of the peace process in Northern Ireland, but it ended up being quite a long and drawn out process. The Provisional IRA announced that they would begin decommissioning their weapons on the 23rd of October 2001. On the 28th of July 2005, an IRA statement instructed all other units to dump arms and by the end of 2005, it was announced that the IRA had officially completed the decommissioning of its arms. Since arriving back in Ireland, the Columbia Three have lived relatively quiet lives. In 2015, Sinn Féin held a night of celebration and remembrance for James Monaghan, which the party's president, Mary Lou MacDonald, attended. Martin McCauley was due to attend a hearing in a Northern Irish court on weapons charges in 2014, but he did not attend, choosing to remain in the Republic of Ireland because he was concerned about being extradited to Colombia if he travelled up into Northern Ireland. Then, in 2016, a peace process in Colombia ended the five-decade-long war. As a part of this peace process, the three men were pardoned by the Colombian government. That's the end of the story of the Colombia Three. It's been 20 years since they were arrested, and we will probably never have an official count of what exactly transpired. Some say the men were training FARC rebels on how to make bombs. Others say that they were talking to them about the peace process, engaging in ecotourism, or just simply birdwatching. I've done my best to explain the facts of the case, 
what they were doing there is up for you to decide. I'll also be posting all of my sources over on Patreon, so please check it out if you'd like to learn more. You can do so over at patreon.com forward slash the troubles podcast. Thanks and see you next time.